welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, 10 seconds about myself. My name is Victor. Oh, damn. He's, he's, he's shooting this. I need to stand there. I hate this. I hate this. My name is Victor, and this is um, uh, the slide that you need to know about me. My, my Twitter is uh, over here, and uh, my Twitter is conveniently placed on all the slides. So if you want to tweet about the session, and this is important, you have to tweet because there's some demo around Twitter and live streams of, of tweets um, that will be used. And uh, I work at a company called um, uh, Confluent, and I work there as a developer advocate. I build uh, highly scalable and highly available whole world applications, and we we're going to be building some of those today uh, with me. And uh, I'm building stuff around Apache Kafka, um, ab about uh, stream processing. Um, primarily, I'm a Java developer. And you was like, "What the hell? Like, what? <laughs> why, why this guy is even here?" But there's interesting backstory here. Uh, before I moved to Java world, I actually started as a C++ and .NET developer. I started with .NET 1.1 and uh, moved to .NET 2.0. And my, uh, my, my graduation work at the university, that also was my um, kind of sort of uh, some, some work that I did for internship when I was working in the bank was written in uh, ISP.NET. Uh, 2.0. There uh, was very interesting times. But when I moved to um, to to do some PG work, my professor say said uh, this stuff not gonna fly here, so I need to learn Java. So I was doing Java. But this talk about uh, for 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 .NET developers, and uh, it necessarily you need to be like a .NET developers to understand this. Now. I'm going to talk about uh, mostly, usually I talk to data engineers, I'm talking to developers, to engineers. Do we have any like people who are doing anything with some big data tools and heard about Kafka at least something today? All right, so th that's, that's, re that's pretty cool. For those of you who don't hear, uh, you will learn a lot of things uh, today. And um, in order to explain something, the, the way how I like to explain things to people, I like to go with um, explaining three things, basically why, what and how. So I will start explaining why uh, at the very beginning the, the, the world did know but that um, the world needs Apache Kafka and uh, now world have it. So um, when we um, build, probably I need to stand here. <laughs> Is it okay if I will stand like, like this, uh, the, the camera, cameraman? Is it fine? Perfect. Um, yeah, so we're building software in, in organizations, in our companies. Uh, we build software as a company to sell software. Uh, there's some uh, companies who build software to run the business, and software is everywhere. And when we're building the software, every interaction that's happening in, uh, in, in uh, all business processes that we're doing involve stream of data, stream of a different event. But essentially what we do with building our application, we're building some sort of data store. After that, we have some persistent layer that reads the stuff from the data, pushes this to business logic layer, and after that, we're drawing this in some sort of front end. So we're building data stores where we need to you know, build actually data flows in, in our organizations. Now, in the typical, uh, typical world of uh, enterprise uh, architecture or enterprise applications look something like this. So we're starting with some small applications that requires one database. Uh, this, this application might be interacting with some other applications through API, might be interacting with some other SaaS system also through some sort of APIs. There's a few seats over here, so if you want to come, come and sit, there's a, uh, some room over here. So. Um, and Usually, uh, in, uh, as we grow or as we progress into um, different uh, aspects of uh, our application architecture, uh, we start seeing that uh, some other people doing some other stuff uh, within our organization or within, I don't know, maybe we're trying to integrate with partners, we're trying to integrate with different services, we're trying to um, integrate this with some other systems. And now, we get this idea that, okay, so we need to get the data for our application from somewhere that we previously didn't, didn't need it. So we need to get maybe another API call, or maybe we can integrate through through database. We can have some tools that uh, will take and replicate their database and our database. This is what the data, um, data engineering look like. Um, and essentially, we end up here. So we, 
how many of you actually seen something like that? Like uh, any like a consultants here, any people who you know were coming to on board, and after that you meeting this architect. He like let me explain. <laughs> Let me explain you how this stuff works here, right? So, and he explaining how this uh, stuff worked like from 10 years ago and how everything involved and now you feel sorry about this person. And actually this is stuff that I'm seeing um, uh, when I was, I was talking to customers. I'm not always talking to developers. I used to be in professional services, did the consultancy. So I've seen uh, those people and uh, interesting enough, uh, even a web, scale companies like LinkedIn might have a similar problem. Not, not this one, but like this specific problem, right? So multiple systems they need to integrate. Uh, they, the, when the LinkedIn was um, is still kind of like a scrappy startup, uh, they were trying to uh, figure out the ways how different sub some components can be developed faster. There's just kind of search will get the, uh, updated from uh, some of the results that user putting in their profiles. So that's why they face this problem. They decide to do something with this. So, um, and uh, what they, they, what they did, they didn't do this uh, from day one. They started developing thing that was far, far, far from the whatever we've seen right now. And they start developing thing called Apache Kafka. Uh, and only today, or maybe <laughs> only right now, we can call it as an event streaming platform, as something that really, really um, new category of the software. But what is event streaming platform? And this is what I'm trying to, um, uh, I will try to answer today. So the way how uh, event streaming platform idea evolved from the uh, from this like a pre-streaming world in the world of when the data was stored in the databases and warehouses, um, uh, stuff that was uh, in this data silos was uh, uh, was supposed to go somewhere and we need to start moving this data out. Uh, where we need to break down certain analytic applications into more microservice approach. This is where um, the event streaming, uh, event streaming platform transformed the ways how the system interacts. Instead of communicating directly or communicating through databases or communicating through APIs or communicating through any other integration system, uh, integration ways, uh, the, the, in the world of like streaming data, stuff start moving into uh, in this approach. And uh, also it enabled a lot of real-time use cases. How many of you heard about this, uh, the COP uh, Lambda architecture? Let's start with Lambda architecture. Any uh, big data folks here who knows that uh, there's a Lambda architecture where you have a batch layer and you have a streaming layer. Batch layer is usually more precise because it has all the data. Streaming, data, uh, streaming layer will give you some immediate result, but because some of the events, some of the data might arrive later, you don't have precise results. So after moving to this uh, from the from the batch oriented world uh, into more streaming world, uh, there was a evolution of this Lambda architecture into CAP architecture that removed this batch um, um, or Hadoop or MAPI view setup operations because uh, tools matured and uh, the tools learn how to deal with late events and how to you know process data that already arriving later. Now, from perspective of you understanding this stuff and you can, you know, whatever you can tell to your colleagues after this talk, um, you need to understand three things. Oh, someone is trying to connect to my laptop to display something. We don't want to do this, right? We don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to see it, no. So I will go ahead and kill my, um, where's my server? I will prevent, uh, prevent for someone showing. You know what happened uh, recently? Some people actually sent some nasty stuff through airdrop. So do not forget this kind of like a secu uh, like information security hygiene through airdrop. Um, just disable it or have it on holy contact. Okay, for the purpose of this presentation or for the purpose of this talk, I have a limited time. So I, you busy people, I want to explain you three things that help you understand what the hell is event streaming platform, right? So, uh, and again, I did mention that Apache Kafka is event streaming platform. Uh, there are some systems that uh, um, follow uh, similar ideas and this over the time start evolving into something similar, but Apache Kafka is still right now one of the, uh, one of the leading uh, pieces of the software that people use to do this. Okay. We're going to be focusing on three things. We're going to be focusing on the storage. We're going to be focusing on the pops up pattern because sometimes people think that Apache Kafka is a messaging system. Who thinks Apache Kafka is a messaging system? 
good. I already teach you already something. Yeah, you you good you good you good people, and you're learning very quickly because you already know that Apache Kafka is a event streaming platform. So when I start a conversation, usually with people saying, "Yeah, yeah, we know this. It's like I don't know, like uh, Microsoft MQ or maybe like uh, SNS or, or Google pops up or whatever messaging system they know." Apache Kafka is like an elephant from the story of uh, blind people and elephant. How many have heard about this story? Okay, so for those of you who don't know, a uh, bunch of uh, blind people run into elephant and uh, because they were blind, they were touching different parts of the elephant. And from the parts that they touch, they trying to figure out what kind of animal it is. Someone touched the nose, sometimes touched the tail, and they have different you know, view on this one. So this is why same story with Apache Kafka, depends of whoever I'm talking to, uh, if I'm talking to messaging guys, they're saying, oh, it's a messaging system. If I'm talking to database guys, oh, it's another weird database whatever thing. If I'm talking to people who knows how to run the MapReduce, they say, oh, it is a system that allows to MapReduce ingestion uh, or data ingestion into MapReduce for Spark jobs or so far and so on. Which brings us to the point of number three, of processing. It's cool when we can bring data, uh, just to push data in and read data out. We're trying to I'll try to show you how um, how you can do something useful with this data, and uh, I'm doing this in only possible, um, in only one possible way. How I know, I was just like uh, asking people to tweet stuff, and after that, I will be processing these tweet tweets in real uh, real time. Um, so we're gonna talk about this now. Let's talk about storage a little quick. Um, different systems. When we're talking about different data systems, you need to establish some score abstractions. We're talking about databases, we're talking about tables. If we're talking about uh, Hadoop and HDFS, we're talking about things like files. But what is the core abstraction for Apache Kafka? Any guesses? Any guesses? Log, exactly. Log, it is. <laughs> Log, it is a data structure that is fundamental core abstraction for Apache Kafka. What is log? Um, you probably heard uh, this term multiple times because we developers, we like to write logs and after that based on this information and in the log, we can, uh, can analyze what is happening. And if you think about this, what log has? It has set of records and usually because you're using this as a source of truth to figure out what the hell is going on with your system, uh, the, those records are immutable and they ordered by certain order, right? Usually it's based on time. So you will be able to read in log from the beginning of the file until the end so you understand what's going on with the system. So the same abstraction placed into the, um, is a foundation, foundational core abstraction for some, some uh, data systems. Uh, they call it like log-based data systems. Um, and actually, uh, there is probably, three fundamental data structure that any uh, software engineer needs to know. So log, because uh, even database, relational database based on the transactional log system. Um, um, hash map, right? So you need to know how the hashing algorithm works because all these uh, distributed systems somehow inherit this uh, hash map pattern and how the data is distributed across uh, multiple uh, the buckets or partitions or how, how call it. Or, and probably um, B3. Why B3? How many of you went to United States? All right, how many of you have been interrogated and in, uh, with the enhanced interrogation techniques when you said, I'm a developer, and the officer told you, okay, if you're a developer, you probably know how to do like a, a the bypass of B3 and explain how you can do this uh, B3 search. Not only for that, like if you if you database engineer, you need to know that the B3 is used to, to build uh, indexes and databases, but also useful when you're trying to, to US. All right, so back to logs. Um, same idea, you already know this because uh, you're writing into the end of the file, you're reading from the beginning of the file, uh, messages or like if different uh, uh, records here are immutable, they immutable and you cannot change this. If you want to change something, if you want to change the state of the world, you send another message. It's a similar to you have a conversation with your significant other and you said something that you're not supposed to say. <laughs> and now you cannot change that. You cannot change it. You need to send, you need to send another message to amend this. <laughs> and this is where latency is important. Depends on how this uh, system, receiving system will be receiving and processing this data, right? 
So this is also very important. This is why uh, latency is important. Now, again, we're reading from uh, from beginning of the file and to the end of the file. Next, uh, now you know logs. So go to point number two. So how this pops up thing works. So this why it looks like a what? Like a queue, right? People saying you're writing to the end of the file, to the end of the queue, and reading from the from the beginning of the file or beginning from the queue. Looks like a queue, right? So this why uh, it is very uh, popular uh, pattern of using Kafka as a messaging system. So what does it mean? Uh, data that you're putting inside the Kafka, we know that formed uh, inside these logs, we call these logs partitions. These partitions can be you know, spread across multiple broker nodes. We have uh, many, many broker nodes. We can have a thousand nodes, a hundred nodes, two nodes as well. Um, and um, we can logically organize those partitions in the things that we call topics. So topics is uh, something that uh, probably your application will be using to produce to or consume from. Uh, topics might have one partition or many partitions. Uh, we're writing data into this uh, partition. This is how it looks like. Now, we have on the other side, we have a consumers who read this data uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in order how this data was written into this file. And there is multiple uh, type of consumers. And uh, this is where things getting a little bit interesting and a little bit different how the people uh, would know from the messaging system. So if you're doing, dealing with any messaging system before, what you do when you read the message, you acknowledge and the messaging system will uh, remove this message from, from the queue. If you're doing topic, maybe a messaging system will distribute this information to different um, uh, uh, consumers or listeners. And after that, if they will receive acknowledgement from dependency, depend on, depend, um, depend on depend on like a pattern of like a durable uh, consumption or, or not, it will remove this. With Kafka, it's not like this. Kafka has more common with uh, distributed database than it has with messaging system because uh, when the consumers consuming these messages, they consume it with their own speed, with their own pace. They can do uh, different things with this data. Um, I'll give you example. Uh, for example, I'm reading a book and the way how I'm reading the book slightly different from the people uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, English world because English is a second language for me. So that's why I need to use vocabulary to look up certain words. So that's why my reading pattern of the same book would be different from your reading pattern and the speed would be different. My son's reading pattern would be even different from all of you because he's reading book much more faster because he don't care about letters in the books. He's trying to find the pictures in the book. <laughs> but. But we still reading same book. We still look into the same file. We look into the same log. So um, if we, if I will be trying to translate the same um, uh, um, same explanation to messaging world, every time you're reading something from the book, you tear down the page. And after that, if someone was late to the party on the very beginning, they will not be able to understand what the hell is going on. With Kafka, we use this concept called offset. Think about bookmarks. You're reading the book, you know where you stop, you put the bookmark. So next time when you start reading the same book, you're getting back to this, uh, to this offset, you read this and say, oh, okay, I stopped here. Um, um, and uh, the, again, I mentioned that multiple consumers might have a different patterns of consuming the data. We'll talk about consumers in a few more seconds. Now, distributed system. How many of you heard about consistent hashing algorithm? That's why I brought up uh, consistent hashing or, or hashing functions, how it's done. For those of you who uh, don't know this, uh, consistent hashing algorithm, it's, it's a, or different variations of this algorithm applied to a majority of distributed, uh, distributed systems, uh, distributed databases, so far and so on, simply because it, um, by agreeing on certain algorithm of key distribution, you can actually win in uh, simplicity of architecture. So you don't need to have some sort of like a service discovery. You don't need to have some sort of node that knows where is dated simply because you know the key and you agree on uh, hashing function. You take a key, apply hashing function, uh, you get some number. After that, divide this number by number of partitions. In this particular case, partitions and topic. And we get some number where we place this data. So why it's called consistent? Because there is consistency between clients, how the clients will discover the data, and consistency between uh, the, the brokers or the, the servers or nodes, how this data will be placed in the other, um, another node. Now, Kafka used the same approach. 
uh, to uh, balance this data across across the uh, multiple uh, partitions, and also it creates very interesting, uh, very interesting side effect. So, if we will be uh, putting data with the same key, every square here it represents a pair of key value. Messages inside the Kafka has a key and has a value. If you're using same key but different value, this data will land on the same partition, meaning that you will be have uh, order preserved the same uh, way how this um, message was uh, initially produced, which is also creates a very interesting quality that Kafka now knows that uh, some sort of ordering guarantee, right? So if you do um, consume producing some of the messages that was involved into um, credit card payment processing, and based on the credit card ID or or some sort of like account ID, all these transactions will land in the same order how they happen, and you don't need to worry that the, your consumer will get some messages out of the order. So this is guaranteed that uh, built in into Kafka using this uh, consistent hashing algorithm. If you didn't specify the key, it's also another problem. Uh, Kafka producer will choose the key for you. It will be just simply do uh, round robin and placing it where whatever is, um, is suitable. So basically it will try to balance across. Now, let's get back to uh, consumption once again. So, um, uh, like I mentioned, multiple uh, consumers can read the data with their own speed. So that's why all these uh, consumers, they focus in, they see in the same uh, state of the world, they see in the same uh, uh, source of truth, and now they can read data with the pace that they're okay with reading it. Kafka is a database, special type of database, but it doesn't mean that Kafka will be suitable for all use cases like uh, random accessing. So there is no random accessing even though there is the keys of value. So in case you want to do some of the uh, random accessing, you need to offload data from the Kafka topics using Kafka Connect. We're gonna be talking about it a little bit. And after that, perform whatever um, the random access uh, search that we know. We can offload this to Redis. We can offload this to, I don't know, like Hazelcast or some 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 other system. Uh, this is also a very important slide. This is a very important slide. Will help me to explain uh, one of the core features of Apache Kafka called um, consumer groups. Doesn't look like it, right? But uh, being a, a kind of engineer, we need to put some of the uh, description to a picture. Okay, in the world of Kafka. Um, we have uh, all these consumers uh, can be um, grouped in the so-called uh, consumer group. And the reason for that is that um, Kafka optimized for reads and the way how the, um, you reading faster from the Kafka topic is by increasing number of consumers in consumer group. Does make any sense? Let me explain this using this picture. So there is a, a special a special process that runs inside one of the brokers. When the um, when your application established connection uh, to Kafka broker, uh, one of the uh, one of the broker nodes become a consumer group controller, or also known as a mummy, mummy bird. So mummy bird is responsible for uh, redistributing and assigning all these partitions. Once you want to consume some data from a particular topic, mummy bird knows that all these worms need to go to the baby birds, and because there's only one consumer in consumer group, all these worms will go to one baby bird. Now, we're seeing that uh, one of the baby birds is choking because there's uh, too many uh, worms to eat. So that's why uh, we're starting another consumer. Um, in, this, in this case, two more consumers. Now, mommy bird will be responsible for balancing this load and distribute this, uh, 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 distribute these messages, distribute this partition across all these three baby birds. So, Let's have an example, we have uh, three partitions in one topic, meaning that we have, not three, 10. Let's do 10. So we have uh, 10 partitions in our topic, and uh, imagine the three, three worms. Why am I saying three? Uh, the, the 10, 10, why am I saying three? Uh, 10, so in this case, this guy will have uh, three, he has four, he has four, because they are part of the same consumer group. Now, if there would be new a uh, baby bird that will hatch from this uh, from the egg right now and join consumer group, mommy bird will stop feeding, meaning that, let me translate this to engineering language, consumer group controller will, s will stop uh, all consumption, will do rebalance of these partitions, 
and after that continue, uh, the consumers will continue to consume the data. And also here you might notice some of the difference between the systems that you have with messaging system, where um, your messaging system pushes some data, but uh, in Kafka, uh, all this consumption is actually consumer driven. So consumers uh, will be requesting more and more food and Mommy Bird will be responsible for providing more and more food. Now, question to the audience. In the same situation, when we have a 10 worms, AKA partitions, if we have a 11 baby birds, what's gonna happen? Just kind of open microphone, you can shout. What's gonna happen, what? Starving. Who said starving? Starving, exactly. So this is very interesting point. So when we have a same number of partitions than a uh, number of uh, consumers in the consumer groups, we have one-to-one -one relationship and we potentially can start more consumers that join consumer group, but they will do nothing. They will be idling because there is no work, right? So this is also a very interesting point of Apache Kafka where you can have end-to-end -end ordered guarantees uh, production of the data and consumption of the data. So you have a system that pro produces your credit card transaction information and you need to uh, perform um, some sort of computation of the data that comes through this, uh, through this uh, Kafka topic in order how these uh, messages were arrived. So you have a same number of your uh, consumers as number of partitions and you have an end-to-end ordering guarantee. But picture is nice. All right, so let me explain this into, uh, the, in the language that engineers will understand with the boxes and uh, arrows. When we have a topic with four partitions, all the partitions will be assigned to one consumer. If we might have multiple consumer groups, remember I will give you an example how we're reading books, uh, me and my son, um, we are representing two different consumer groups because we're representing different applications. We're representing different use cases that are interested in this data. So same thing is a consumer group. When your application starts, you need to specify consumer group ID. In this case, a consumer group controller will be responsible for managing all this stuff for you. And when we have two different consumer groups, all these consumer groups will be consuming data with, with their own uh, speed because they have uh, their own uh, ways how to process this data. Um, when we have a one-to-one -one, a relationship between number of partitions and number of consumers in consumer group, we will have kind of like an end-to-end flow and assignment uh, of partitions will be represented the same way how it was assigned in the topic. What if one of these uh, consumers will go down? Assignment would be placed to, to another consumer. So some of the consumers will be receiving messages from two partitions. So, um, let me summarize this. So we have a producers that not uh, uh, depend on any consumers. We have a consumers who uh, also don't depend on this. Uh, so consumers is over here, uh, producers are over here. And uh, in the middle here, we have this broker that's responsible for handling this data. So the cool thing about this diagram is that your, uh, you can scale different aspects of your application. If your application needs to produce data faster, you start more, 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 more producers. If your application needs to consume this uh, data faster, you'll learn that there's consumer groups that uh, are using the multiple consumers in the consumer group, you're allowed to do a parallel reads. And also in, in the middle, Kafka brokers, you can scale them also independently in, in case of you want to provide more um, more serious uh, resiliency and so forth and so on. Now, uh, there's a special, special, there's something special in, uh, in, uh, in the Kafka as a, as a project. A um, few components that we learn already, it's a producer, consumer, and the brokers. It's usually where everything ends for many people. They just start, okay, because it's a messaging system, blah, 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 I will be doing, uh, using this one. But Kafka, uh, as an as a, as a open source product or as open source tool is actually much more. So let me switch to this one. So uh, Kafka, Apache Kafka also includes this, uh, the framework that is a part of the um, Apache Kafka project called Kafka Connect. So it is a framework for, sorry, for Java developers to develop these connectors, but as a, as a developer who don't care about the Java, just need, or, or maybe a data engineer, you just need to bring data in and data out, you don't need to know Java in this case. Connect allows you just get the prepackaged connector and just uh, ship this and start this process and start pumping data from anywhere, uh, virtually from any source, or pump data virtually to any source. I will be using a connector from Twitter 
uh, today. So that's why a reminder to tweet about this session using hashtag and this is Sydney. Um, and uh, how the data will land, I don't know because I never wrote this connector and I don't know how to work with Twitter API. So that's why I just took the connector off the shelf that allowed me to, do, to read this data from Twitter. Now, um, in, in, in case of deployment, uh, deployment is supported to any possible uh, uh, any possible tool. You can deploy this as an RPM package. You can deploy as a Debian package. You can run this in a container. You can run this in Kubernetes. Uh, there is a managed uh, platform, like we build uh, Confluent Cloud, which is managed platform for Apache Kafka and all streaming platforms. We support uh, uh, deployment of certain connectors there as well. And uh, this is like a way how you can build uh, data pipelines fairly easy without writing any code. Um, another thing, Kafka provides the way how data would be replicated, it's also built in. Many messaging systems uh, adding this kind of capabilities as an afterthought, Kafka has it from the day one, from the, from the not the from the day one, it, you have it as a Kafka user from the day one, Kafka actually developed this over the time, but uh, it's, it's good that it's, it's there. So the way how it's, how it's done in uh, terms of um, how data will be securely safe on other nodes. Uh, the partitions, uh, certain partitions might be a leader partition, some partitions will be replica partitions. You see, Kafka was very advanced uh, tool and Kafka was very progressive tool in terms of diversity and uh, fighting against uh, uh, all these like uh, slaves and masters and stuff. So from day one, there were leaders and they follow it. All right, so Kafka was always progressive in this case. Your producer and consumer always read data and always write data to leader partition. This is how Kafka perso uh, performs their you know, consistency guarantee. Um, so once the data was acknowledged and written to a uh, leader, so consumer will get the same state of the world. There's no, there's no like eventual consistency where you know, some of the consumers can, can read this from, uh, from replicas and these replicas might not have fresh information. Um, if the replica will go down, one of the nodes will go down, what's gonna happen? Some of these um, uh, follower replicas will uh, take over responsibilities of a leader. So as you can see here, we have this uh, uh, partition number four that was stored on the uh, node number four. So what's gonna happen is uh, partition number four, uh, replica of partition number four from the broker number two will be take over responsibility of the leader. So, um, and uh, there's different things that can be configured, different acknowledgement mechanism, how we can do from the producer side or the consumer side. So uh, let's um, kind of like, let's summarize. So log is a special type of a durable messaging system, uh, similar to traditional messaging system, but better scalability, better fault tolerance, and uh, also allows you to always replay and read the data even after the data was produced, but it was down or something like that. Cool. Let's do some demo, right? Uh, relax, it's not Twitter demo yet. So uh, since we're talking about uh, .NET here, um, there are, where's my, yeah. So first of all, I want to show you something uh, to, s to, um, to explain that I'm legit here. So there is a project called C Sharp Client for Apache Kafka that developed by Microsoft. And now they recommend to use Confluent <laughs> Kafka.net. <laughs> so this is where this is where like we're starting into into the into the game what Confluent does. So as a company, we also sponsoring development of open source Apache Kafka. If you will go and see KafkaApache.org, you will see multiple uh, people who work at Confluent actually committing to this open source project. Plus, we do um, we do support uh, development of uh, certain uh, open source uh, clients for Apache Kafka.net is included, and uh, as you can see, even we got this. Um, uh, confirmation from the Microsoft that even uh, Microsoft people uh, recommend to use uh, Confluent.net uh, uh, client. It's available in Nugget, so you can go there and grab it, so you can get the source code. Some of the examples that I'm going to be showing today, uh, you can uh, see um, on this GitHub page. And um, let's, uh, let's try to produce something. 
Another thing that you as a developer want to start with Apache Kafka, you either need um, like Kafka deployed somewhere uh, or you can get this package uh, from Apache website or you can get the package from our website because this package includes certain tools that allows you to be more productive as a developer. Specifically, uh, there's a Confluence CLI that allows you to start to, uh, Kafka, stop Kafka, stop, start and stop different components of the Kafka, so you will be able to uh, do stuff locally. And after, most importantly, it allows you to erase whatever crap you did because we make some mistakes, we do some bugs, so you don't need to go and track this down and uh, figuring out why your stuff is not working because there is a like a start from scratch command out of the box, which is my favorite feature of this platform. Um, uh, when I said it's uh, available somewhere in the cloud, so we do have managed service that's available um, in Asia as well. Uh, Microsoft uh, have a thing called uh, uh, HD Insight, which is uh, their uh, big data stack, and uh, Kafka is a part of HD Insight. So uh, choose whatever you like to use. Uh, we, uh, we also run in Azure if you're running there. Now, so let's do, uh, let's take a look on local, local development and how it uh, looks like. Let me switch to, to some of the stuff that I'm gonna be using. All right. Um, I already running my um, status. Okay, so I'm already running my Kafka. I'm running my Zookeeper. Kafka depends on Zookeeper, but it's not very long. Zookeeper leaves there for maybe last year. We're working to remove this. Um, this came registry. It's a REST, uh, a REST service that I use to store some of the data about, uh, some metadata about my data. So imagine uh, we live in a world where the different developers develop uh, their application in the language of their choice. Crazy, right? So I can develop in Java, uh, you can develop in .NET, and C can be friends. We don't need to like fight against, against each other anymore. So a schema allows us to define the contract that we communicate or format of the message. Or like if I'm translate to engineering world with serialization, deserialization format. Kafka doesn't care what kind of stuff you're putting inside. Uh, Kafka don't do uh, introspection, doesn't do deserialization on the broker side um, because um, Kafka has this concept of um, a, um, zero copy, meaning that when the data goes through, through the network into the Kafka, Kafka streams this directly from this uh, network socket into the file system. So even though Kafka written on Java, there is no much of the garbage created by producing a lot of messages because we're relying on a low level uh, system calls there. So, and given the fact that it's just a, some sort of like a payload, some sort of bytes, Kafka don't care, my clients care. So in this case, if I'm reading data or writing data in the .NET or Go, uh, I want to read this data into Java and Python. So uh, this is why I I'm using a schema. And there's example that, uh, that shows how we can do. So let me start this uh, .NET or on localhost. So in this case, I need to specify address a broker, I need to specify a topic with some schema, and now I can start producing something into this, uh, into this topic because my Kafka is up, um, and I can start writing something like, I don't know, let's put something interesting. Uh, where is it? Um, uh, username. So let's see if you get the reference. Where is it? Uh, anyone? Anyone? Best uh, Christmas movie? Little Weapon? Anyone? Uh, maybe another? Uh, another best Christmas movie? All right, so I just produced two, two messages. So in this case, uh, messages land in the Kafka topic. So what I can do uh, to read those? I can uh, use my uh, the C Sharp uh, uh, consumer to read this, but I was, I'm trying to sell you kind of sort of cross-platform thing. So let's see how I can do. Uh, if I do, there's a Kafka console uh, consumer, I need to specify Okay, let's do this. So we don't need this. Uh, we don't need this because we're using uh, localhost uh, 1922. And topic, we said topic, topic with schema. Um, and as you see here, I start doing this from beginning. I just, you know, read this data and is happening to display this data correctly. 
even though I didn't specify any schema and stuff, just simply because the way how the Avro handles schemas, uh, handles strings is actually, um, you know, cross-platform. It's just placed there like a unique platform. So that's why I can read this word, the symbol of consumer, which not working in the cases where I need to run um, some of the binary data. If I'll put in some of the numbers there, so I will see some of the, some of the stuff. In this case, I need to actually use is uh, Kafka uh, Avro consumer. And uh, when I will reading this data in Avro format, I will actually get full, uh, full thing that I'm expecting. I see schema, I see how my object should look like. And also you might notice, my application still, I can still do some of the pr production, but I still, this my consumer was not available or didn't start bef before I start producing these messages. So let's do, uh, what's another uh, famous um, uh, Christmas movie? Maybe, uh, like this, right? Home Alone. It's another also the, the, the robbery type of movie in the Christmas. So same thing with Die Hard, right? So in this case, you cannot say that Die Hard is not Christmas movie. Um, so, so first of all, you see my application continue to work and so I'm reading data as it arrives. But also like uh, on the very beginning, I specified that I want to read this from beginning, meaning that like every time I, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me do this. Uh. So you will be able to see, uh, no, you will not be able to see. It's, uh, or you see it on the very top bottom. Let me do this then I will, I will make it work for you. Yeah. So um, here I'm specifying that I need to read this uh, topic uh, from beginning, meaning that every time I'm resetting my set, I'm starting this reading this book from the very beginning and this is how I, you know, consuming in producing, uh, uh, consume and produce uh, data in this um, in this application. Again, I continue to do this. Um, if I will start this application uh, without specifying this from beginning, meaning that I will be listening only for, for the fresh data. This is how uh, you can emulate the same behavior if you have uh, any messaging system because you're starting only from real time data, and here you're doing well, something like this and we get some data. So you get the point. So we do have a bunch of, um, a bunch of example application that can integrate uh, with um, uh, different, uh, just simple producer consumer. Um, if you're not in this uh, Avro Jazz, I've seen there's some of the gRPC talks here. So probably you're doing some of the protobuf stuff. We have some example how we can do this like protobuf. It's another format that allows you to define schema and based on the schema generate some of the cross platform representation. Um, and also like uh, we do have example how you can uh, uh, write data in and read data from uh, the Confluent Cloud. Uh, you can adopt this example to, uh, to do f and connect to any service that you're using uh, in terms of this. So if you've seen, if you've been in the, one of the NDC conferences in the past, uh, there was a talk about Kafka in the past and uh, they were using the slightly different API. Right now, API is much more fluent, much more uh, nicer to use. So for example, uh, there is a um, strongly typed producer config. So do you need to go and create like a generic uh, the dictionary if you need to provide this configuration? The API is more fluent. You can know whatever stuff you need to put this. In this particular case, there is some of the uh, bootstrap server information, some other configs. So um, the, the client itself is evolving and it's also evolving on, um, uh, on uh, to being like a native API, to being a tool with the, some of the idiomatic uh, APIs that available at .NET. Plus, uh, this, uh, this, um, this client depends on the library called LibRD Kafka, which is a C uh, implementation. Um, and this, uh, this is the foundation for many open source clients, including Python, including Go, including some of the uh, dot, uh, sorry, um, not GS clients that use Liberty Kafka. Um, and uh, this, uh, this client is fully compatible with all modern features of Apache Kafka. So uh, this, is, this is basic foundation. This is how you start, this is how you're doing this. So let's move on to, um, to processing aspect. Now you learn how you produce data in, uh, read data out. So let's do some of the complex stuff. Um, so this is where we're going to be talking about things that are called stream processing or streaming or, 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 or processing stream of events and things like that. So essentially 
as data arrive, we want to make some of the decisions, we want to make some of the processing, we need to do something with this data as it arrives into the system. Not that we're collecting this data and after that we'll do computation at the end of the day. No, it is so 2002. Because right now we can and we, we will process data as it arrives because um, um, we have increased number of uh, um, of the ways how we can generate this data. Our business evolved because we cannot rely on um, on some of the like obsolete data from the from the past. Now we need to make some decisions based on some real time data. Um, we uh, we like to call this uh, not the even real time. There is even complex uh, more more complex aspect here, like how you combine the real time data with data that historical like has some some historical meaning. So this why all these new applications we call them. Um, contextual event streaming application where we combine real-time aspect that comes from the, for example, some of the, I don't know, sensors like, uh, like a GPS on your phone and uh, combining this with data that, come that was stored in our, uh, in our system. Uh, for example, some of the CRM system and based on the CRM data, we can join and get some of the better experience to our customers. Um, and um, one of the examples I want to use here uh, just simply, I like this example simply because people listen, because people always listen when I talk about money, especially like credit card transactions or like payments or like ledgers, balances, all this stuff. People love this. So this is why this example will stick into your mind because this is about fraud, uh, fraud protection. So like especially like very close to my heart because I travel and like my, my credit card can be uh, stolen or it can be um, can be not stolen or can be blocked because of uh, the, some of the system in my bank will think, oh, some fraudulent transaction. How we can do that? I'm using very sophisticated algorithm here to do this. So let's just say if um, authorization attempts from same credit card happened within five minute window, let's just say three, more than three authorization attempts happened, we can consider this as a fraudulent activity. So this is why we have a st input stream of events that have authorization attempts for a particular credit card number. Now we need to analyze the stream on the fly and uh, make a decision if this transaction is fraudulent and only if it's a fraudulent, we need to create uh, um, uh, the record in this uh, called possible fraud uh, uh, topic or stream that will include uh, information about credit card and some other system will decide what to do next. So uh, as a matter of fact, this is a full-blown stream processing application, believe me or not. So this is where um, things get interesting. Like, Victor, where's .NET? Like, where, where's Java? <laughs> Why? Where's the, all this kind of, uh, how we can build this application? So um, we start uh, working on this uh, stream processing world uh, very, on the very early stages. And we were pioneers, we were able to do development on the tools that we know, like Java, Scala, blah, blah, blah. But over the time, we understand there are other people in this world, like other engineers who are interested in this one, right? And I have a specific slide to, to, prove, uh, to prove me. So we started thinking, okay, how we can make, how we can translate some of the, some of the idea of stream processing into these um, uh, tools that people can use without knowing Java, .NET, uh, or, uh, or whatever, right? So people know SQL. How many of you know SQL? How many of you have been on the interview when they're asking you about SQL, right? This is, this is the most important thing, like if you can answer the interview. How many of you know how to do a left join in MS SQL? I'm just, I don't know. <laughs> you, you're good, you're good guys, uh, that's awesome. Um, so now we're creating this something called stream. This is where we um, have a certain uh, discrepancy between um, our thing and uh, standard SQL. There's no keyword stream. Um, we call it uh, the possible fraud. And this stream will be populated from events that derived from authorization attempt stream where we need to define a window. So we actually want to see if this authorization event, uh, authorization attempt happened within certain window. We just make this assumption that five minute window, no one actually will be spending or sliding this credit card often that uh, five minutes probably who designed this algorithm never met my wife, doesn't matter. Going, uh, going next, we're interested only in credit card number and how many authorization attempts happened with, with, uh, with the five minute window. And we're grouping this uh, by card number and we're saying the count needs to be more than three. So 
this is a legitimate stream processing application that can generate some of the possible fraud output. Um, and uh, some of the things that you notice here, um, uh, it's not just a simple filtering when we need to read the and pass this through. It's actually involved some of the state storage. Um, things like how we would know how many messages we collected over the five minutes, like where this data came from. And like, because in order to calculate a result for a particular step, we need to know some data from the past. This is what's the difference between stateless stream processing and stateful stream processing. Um, and uh, the things like uh, KSQL that I'm gonna be talking right now, it is actually knows how to deal this and knows how to you know, provide you storage. Uh, spoiler alert, actually uses Kafka as a storage to, um, to store the state. So yeah, so <laughs> this is where we are like, oh yeah, everyone knows Cal and Java. Um, no, not everyone. So we do have a lot of uh, people, data engineers who um, don't give a damn about uh, Scala at all, or, or, or some data engineers who know uh, SQL very well, or some of the data engineers who know some of the BI tools very well. And uh, this is where we actually start addressing this group of people who are interested in performing stream processing operations without knowing uh, programming. So uh, KSQL, you can iterate, integrate with the KSQL through the UI. We have uh, this development tool called uh, Control Center. Also uh, can be used for monitoring. Um, you just, if you get this uh, Confluent um, uh, the package, the Control Center included here, you can use KSQL with uh, UI. Uh, as uh, engineers, we love uh, con uh, CLI. I'm gonna be using CLI all the way today. Uh, also, you can use this for the REST interface. So sometimes there's some, uh, some of the interactivity uh, that's um, uh, required to submit these queries. Um, and this is actually, you can say it's a kind of like a weak play because uh, people asking me, hey, wh where's this like stream processing f library for .NET? And we say, yeah, you know, we just developed this KSQL thing so you can actually use KSQL uh, from your .NET application and submit whatever complex uh, stream processing application you want written in SQL um, through, through REST. Um, and after that, you can get a result uh, through Kafka topic, and this result will be published and will be available for multiple consumers. Again, remember in the picture with the uh, baby birds. And also, uh, it, is has a, it has a headless mode where we can actually pack this file that includes my uh, SQL state rules uh, and deploy this in the server. And after that, it will be constantly running, reading data from Kafka topic, processing this data, and putting data back in Kafka topic. So the way how it interaction looks like, um, the KSQL server can run uh, independently. You still can run your applications. You can write uh, any type of application. You can produce data from, uh, from your application and uh, write data into Kafka. And again, cool thing about this, these components can be scaled independently, so you don't need to um, um, you don't need to worry about some of the uh, like larger use cases and smaller use cases. You can always start with small and after that um, go, um, go all the way with all these kind of things. All right, so let's see, uh, let's see some of the real world stream processing. And the way how we're gonna be looking at the real world stream processing, uh, let me do this full screen and I'm doing this. So um, here is uh, my uh, KSQL. Let me do let me do exit. So you'll see very nice banner that you will see that we actually in uh, KSQL. So the way how it works, I'm actually running this uh, uh, cluster uh, in my um, in my Kubernetes uh, in my uh, Kubernetes account. So if I do uh, Kubernetes get pods. Let's see multiple things running here. So I'm running my uh, three nodes of Kafka broker, running three nodes of Zookeeper, and I'm running my connect uh, Twitter connector. So if I will go here and see if I have any data, I can do select. Okay, bless you. Select, let's see, where's my Username, okay. So if anyone wants to tweet about me using NDC hashtag, uh, you will be able to see your, your, your tweet um, on this screen. And um, you'll see a bunch of tweets because again, I already tested this tweet about myself, things like that. So, but uh, this is what we, we're calling um, um, 
continuous query. So right now, what is happening, I connected to this um, uh, Kafka cluster, and I starting reading from the top of my tweet. Even though there were some tweets, uh, I'm not showing this to you, so I'm giving opportunity to tweet about this, and you will see your tweet on, this, on, on the screen. If you don't want to do this, I will do what, what, what we Russian people know of doing, is creating a bunch of fake Twitter accounts <laughs> and tweet about this. Okay, so we're going to see the Sydney as they Hermosa is Yep, yep. Pair programming is tweeting about a SQL. Right? And if I will tweet, if I will tweet, we should see this tweet on the stage. If I didn't make any mistake, let's go to space and Twitter will fire host, will fire this event. There is connector that listens for a particular event. And someone already tweet this here. Ah, it works. And where's my, where's my, where's my tweet? Where's my tweet? <laughs> the cool thing about this, KSQL understand Unicode. First of all, you will see uh, there's some of the uh, beautiful uh, characters. And there should be something from, from my, because my, my guy, uh, should be, you know. Ah, okay, okay. I even like failed to to type my username correctly. What a <laughs> what a loser. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. And this, those people asking us to tweet about them. Here. Okay. So let's do this because Twitter sometimes not allowed to do this. The the most important thing I wanted to show you here is that uh, KSQL is actually supporting emojis. Emojis. Okay. So cool. Uh, let jokes aside. Um, if I want, thank you, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> this is what you get when you're trying to do live tweeting demo on the stage, right? Thank you. People complimenting your appearance. I'm trying. So, by default, uh, we're reading only on the real-time event. So, meaning that our uh, continuous query was not uh, was not there during the time where we are uh, tweeting something, but. I'm actually running this uh, this um, this thing for a while right now, and uh, it's actually uh, collecting a lot of data, collecting a lot of tweets. So in this case, I'm going here and I'm resetting my offset. So that's why when I starting doing this uh, select once again, I'm replaying this Kafka topic in order to do all this kind of uh, uh, computation. You see all these things that happened in the past, like some of the things that I tweeted before and so far and so on. See. That's pretty cool. All right. Now, um, let me show you quickly something about a stateful stream processing. In this particular case, I do have a um, uh, small, small application, the stream processing application that includes multiple things. So first thing is, this is how I am uh, creating this uh, uh, Twitter stream from a raw data because Twitter uh, connector pushes only uh, JSON to me. And this is how I'm telling this uh, uh, KSQL server that I'm actually running JSON, so uh, the KSQL server will be able to parse this data and work with this natively. KSQL works natively with this um, uh, JSON. There are some helper functions that allow you to extract some of data from the JSON. So in this case, it uses this JSON path to, to navigate through this JSON uh, payload and create this username using screen name and some other things. So in this particular case, I'm filtering by hashtag, so I can use um, uh, special functions like uh, that will lowercase all these um, um, hashtag entities. So in this particular case, it will be using NDCC DNA. Uh, I'll skip that. So um, this is how I'm defining that how many people will be tweeting about uh, this presentation uh, or maybe how many people do tweeting this. So this is why I want to capture this uh, state that we called user uh, tweet count uh, that I will be using here. So I'm saying that within one hour window, my, my presentation starts hour, almost an hour ago. Um, people will be tweeting, and I want to collect a count. How many people uh, tweeted about this, um, this awesome uh, presentation uh, within, this, uh, within this period? I want to change the way how I'm displaying some data. So in this particular case, I also can apply the function that transforms my same thing as you do uh, with any database-related code. And now I'm creating a table 
from the table of this tweet where I have only Twitter account more than if, if the people were tweeting more than three times of me. Uh, let's see if it actually works. And we'll see if we have anyone who um, actually tweeted uh, more than three times. Um, maybe my, yeah, my bot tweet that tweeted more than four times. You can try to beat this. Uh, we will say, hey, NDC. Uh huh. I know this is. Yep. So I'll tweet it. And and uh, the count should uh, should also change in the real time. So we will see another event from this table um, that will include some of the data that came from the new tweet. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. There should uh, there should be. There should be something. Let's try it again. Let's do this again. This is the copying again. A number one. Come on, dude. Update, 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 update. Okay, two. And do hashtag two. We'll see. Uh, Ah, actually, this is maybe a result from the um, from the previous hour because the you know we roll over to to new hours. So this is why it might be data from from another uh, from another hour. Some hour the window already jumped, and let's do number five. Let's see if it's actually working. Yeah. So this this was data from uh, previous hour, and this is now fresh data. And I have this uh, you know already deployed. See, this data continuously updating state of this table. All right, so if you want to learn more about, oh, I'm sorry, too, too fast. If you want to learn more about stream processing in general, I highly recommend to go to grab uh, the, the books that was written some of the people from, from, uh, from Confluent. Specifically, I highly recommend to read the Isle of Logs that will allow you to understand um, the, this kind of like a mentality behind of log-based data structures. And uh, we have a Slack where you can ask all your questions around. Uh, if you followed me, I will be tweeting this slide, so don't, uh, don't worry about taking picture of this. And one last thing. So um, I was talking about this uh, demo uh, that runs inside Kubernetes. If you are uh, available today night and you're interested in Kubernetes type of jazz, uh, we will be hosting meetup not far from a uh, place where we were boarding to the boat. Uh, um, yesterday. So go register if you want to uh, learn how this demo works in terms of uh, some of the Kubernetes aspects. I really appreciate that you spend this hour with me. I enjoy this. I, ho I hope you enjoy this. I heard there's some rating system in this, uh, in this conference. There's, uh, I was told that the green one is good, so probably you also should, should, should use green one. Um, thank you very much for your time. As always, I'm available for enhanced interrogation. Uh, any questions? There's no, there's no stupid questions. Ask me anything. Thank you so much. <laughs>